Welcome back to another episode of Music Biz Weekly Podcast. I'm one of your two co-hosts, Jay Gilbert. Mike Branvold is out this week, but he'll be back soon. Today, we have a really great guest. Uh, but before we get into it, let's thank our sponsors. The Music Biz Weekly Podcast is brought to you by Bandzoogle, built by musicians for musicians. Bandzoogle is an all-in-one platform, makes it easy to build a beautiful website and EPK for your music. Bandzoogle powers the websites for tens of thousands of musicians from around the world, weekend warriors to Grammy winners. All the features you need for a professional website are already built in, like hosting and a custom domain name, dozens of fully customizable design templates, tools to sell your music and merch commission-free, commission-free crowdfunding and fan subscription features, mailing list tools to grow your fan list and send newsletters, social media integrations, and live support from their musician-friendly team seven days a week. Music Biz Weekly podcast listeners can go to bandzoogle.com, try it for free for 30 days, just use the promo code MUSICBIZWEEKLY, all one word, Music Biz Weekly, and you'll get 15% off your first year of any subscription. Um, we're also sponsored by our good friends over at Disc Makers. We know it's a digital world out there, but there's still an important role for physical media for today's independent musician. Digital royalty payments are so small that selling products like CDs, vinyl, T-shirts at gigs has become a very important income generator. So for every CD you sell at a gig, you need roughly 3,000 streams to make about the same amount of money, and that's a lot of streams. So our friends at Disc Makers are the place to go for your discs and other physical media, including vinyl, USB drives, and even T-shirts. And we have a special offer for Music Biz Weekly listeners. You'll get free shipping on CD orders of 100 or more CDs, just use the code FREEBIZ and you'll get up to $150 value. That's uh, free shipping. Uh, just use that code FREEBIZ. And also a very special shout out to our friends at Hypebot. Uh, thank you, Bruce. We appreciate everything. So today we have a really great guest to really kind of break down music publishing. What does it all mean? And that's Randall Foster, who's the uh, Vice President of Business Development and the General Manager of the Nashville Offices of Symphonic Distribution. Uh, you need to watch this one. Uh, take notes. Here's Randall Foster. Build a stunning band website in minutes with Bandzoogle. Go to bandzoogle.com to start your free 30-day trial and use the promo code MUSICBIZWEEKLY to get 15% off the first year of any subscription. Today, we're joined by Randall Foster, Vice President of Business Development and the General Manager of the Nashville Offices of Symphonic Distribution. Um, one of the most knowledgeable music executives that I know, and his team is blazing new trails in music distribution and monetization, and he has a background in music publishing, which is perfect for our conversation today of Music Publishing 101. Randall, thanks so much for uh, joining our little show this week. Jay, Good thank to see you for you. having me. It's always a pleasure to see you, and I appreciate you inviting me uh, to come talk about this subject that's near and dear to my heart. <laughs> thank you, brother. Before we dig in, tell us a little bit about your background in publishing, Tell us a little bit about symphonic distribution for those that don't know. Certainly. So I, uh, <clears throat> I've been at symphonic for two and a half years here running Nashville operation, as well as uh, looking after business development and, uh, and a, a number of monetization lines that were working prior to that though, I spent five great years at a, at a fantastic independent music publishing company called Olay. And uh, Olay was a, was a venture capital backed company, uh, was really early to the game, I think, um, as far as the you know, deployment of funds, acquiring large catalogs um, business, which of course we've all seen blow up today. Um, right. When we got in, I, I got into Olay when, when normal multiples were like four to seven X. Um, the good old days. Seven, the good old days. But, uh, but while I was there, we deployed about half a billion dollars by wow. the property and, uh, and, and really, really got our hands dirty with some fantastic catalogs and writers and people like the rock band Rush and mm. Timbaland and uh, wow. Cheryl Crow's creative partner, Jeff Trott, Sony uh, Pictures catalog. We really, it was a diverse acquisition strategy, and it was really baptism by fire for me into the publishing space. Because prior to that, I'd been in labels and distribution in, in more, former, more formally 
licensing and sync licensing um, pretty much my entire career. Wow. So the parlay over into publishing was was a new adventure and one that was wrought with lots of learning curves. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I'm glad to be able to talk today a little bit about that. Now at Symphonic, we are known first and foremost as a distribution company, but we're also set up to help artists monetize their music publishing through publishing administration. In addition to that, we monetize YouTube and all user generated content platforms like TikTok, Triller, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, we have a sync division called Bodega Sync, which of course has to do with publishing because that's part of the discussion. It's sync. Sure. And, uh, and, and we're, we're just, we're having fun. It's been, a, it's been a good two and a half years. And despite the pandemic, um, we're seeing some artists really succeed. And yeah. It's been a good ride. I'm ready to, ready to take my mask off and get back out to the show. <laughs> yeah. But until then, I'm glad to sit and talk to you on zoom. For a yeah. Week. Well, you, symphonic is really making a, a name for itself and, you see it in the press, you see it in the innovative ways that you're approaching monetization. Uh, I tell everybody who will listen that, you know, the Symphonic blog is one of the best in the business, if not the best, because there's so much to know about the music industry, especially today. It's not as simple of a business as it once was. And what I love about the Symphonic blog is you'll take things and show people the basics that they need to know for all these different subjects, whether it's with DSPs or socials or just best practices across the board. So uh, for those who haven't uh, checked out the Symphonic blog, make sure you do that. It's a, a really great source uh, for Michael and I, for your morning coffee. So kudos to that. Um, so let's yeah, dive right in. That. Well, What's that? The check's in the mail for that plug. <laughs> Thanks. So let, let's let's dig in. Music publishing is it's such an impar, important part of our business. And for the longest time, you know, I worked for record companies. We didn't deal a lot with the publishing side. We might have lunch with those fine people from time to time, but we certainly weren't collaborating maybe as much as we should have. So talk a little bit about like what does even a music publisher do? So I think it's important to go back to the very fundamentals of what music publishing is. So Please. we can talk about what a music sure. publisher does. Um, because a lot of people, I talk to a lot of artists who will say, I'll say, you know, what's your publishing situation? They'll go, oh, I'm published. I'm published by BMI. You know, <laughs> that's not right. how it works. So um, from a creator standpoint, publishing has to do with the underlying, the underlying composition. Um, possessed in any sound recording. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't require sound recording for it to be published. You can write an entire book of songs and, and publish it as a print manuscript and it's published. But the reality is every song that you hear everywhere in the world, someone somewhere wrote that song and that song and that songwriter are, are valuable and that value is, is, is called music publishing. Yeah. So in the most basic terms, what a music publisher does is, is typically owns part of or all of uh, a composition in which, <clears throat> in which they take that composition and they work to maximize its financial viability. And they can do this in a number of ways. There's a million different ways to skin this cat. But, um, but you know, in, in the case of, let's just say a, a popular song um, that, you, that you might know, um, for goodness sakes, Hey Jude. Okay, in the case of Hey Jude, we have we have the Beatles reco recording of Hey Jude, which is great. And uh, the record label that did that obviously is going to pay mechanical royalties on that. And mechanical royalties predate digital, so mechanical actually referred to the mechanical stamping of uh, actually when it started of of uh, <laughs> our piano rolls. And, um, and then vinyl, and then eight track, and then tape, and then CD, and then now we're back to vinyl. And um, in digital, of course. And so that is, that is one lane in which um, an, a songwriter makes money off their music. But the cool thing about the US copyright law in, in the statutory mechanical license that's attached to it is that there's, there's a rule that's, I will grossly paraphrase here, that basically says anyone can cover your song. You write a song, anyone can cover it. 
Um, and so naming a song like Hey Jude, the famous Beatles hit, of course, how many covers of that exist? Hundreds, right. and hundreds, if not thousands. Well, each and every iteration of that yields revenue for the publishing. And so that that is one lane in which publishing companies make money. And, and when I was in publishing, one of the things we looked at was back catalog. In ways, how how do we how do we monetize a back catalog? How do we take this music and 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 really really hammer on the creative and yeah. find ways to make more money with it? And one way is to get people to cut it. And yeah. I know when I was at Olay, one of our big wins, um, Garth Brooks's last album, we had a cut, which is it's pretty amazing when Garth Brooks picks the phone up and, and, and calls your GM and asks them to send over songs. Yeah. Um, and, and we had a cut and that cut was a 12 year old song that had been written and was part of our publishing company, but that had sat dormant for 12 years. And this is, yeah. this was an unreleased song. This was catalog, deep, deep catalog, but he cut the song and, and it was a song called people loving people. And, um, and it just worked and it fit the aesthetic of what he was doing. But so, so most publishing companies, especially from the Nashville perspective, there's, there's kind of a coastal perspective and a Nashville perspective, I feel, mm -hmm. on publishing. Um, but most Nashville publishing companies keep a staff of creative folks as well as, as, as royalty collections folks um, who, who work on maximizing the values of those catalogs in those lanes. So the creative folks are going to do a number of things, one of which they're going to work with songwriters that are signed to the catalog, signed to the publishing company to help them improve their craft, to help them improve the craft of songwriting. And in that process, they're going to get to know that catalog. That's half of their job. The other half of the creative staff's job is to find opportunities for that music. So in a lot of cases, that means knowing what artists are going into the studio when, who's looking for songs, who's cutting songs, uh, and in and, and, and hoping to make it onto the record. So, you know, there's there's a, a number of baby steps on the way to becoming a number one single. Yeah, yeah. One of which is one of which is pitching your songs and getting a hold on yeah. the song. You pitch the song, the artist says, I kind of like this. I'm gonna hold it, I'm gonna think about it. Yeah. Then the artist goes into the studio to cut sides. When the artist goes in to cut sides, they cut a slew of songs. They might cut 30 or 40 songs to whittle it down to 12. Um, so when the artist does that, you've got to cut. Fingers crossed. Right. right. At that point, you hope you make the album. If you make the album, fantastic. Are you the single? <laughs> there's, there's a, there, there are just there's baby steps all along the way and these creatives with their relationships with the a and staff help kind of mold and work that all the way to the point of release and at the point of release you know the the, the grand champion gold medal situation is when you when you make the lead single off of a yeah. big album right um, it used to be that album cuts paid pretty well because when we were selling 12 song records and when that was your only choice to consume, people would go out, they'd go to their local Best Buy or their local Tower Records and they'd buy the, the record on release day. Yeah. And on release day, the songs on that record that maybe were just more filler tracks would all make the same amount of money as the single. Right. Right. Well, we've obviously changed that quite a bit with digital. And right. so now singles are so important. And, and songwriters can do okay getting cuts, but songwriters, when they get singles, get windfalls yeah. and life-changing kind of monies. And yeah. so um, that's the that's really the target that most publishers are chasing after. Now, Nashville still has song pluggers who go and, and push these songs at the A&R staff. There are a lot, I, I feel that on the coasts, the songwriting situation is a lot more um, camp-based. I feel like the songwriters, it's about being part of a camp. It's about being part of a creative team and, and being in the room. And, and you can see that it, even in the, in the songwriter splits. Yeah. You know, you've got, you got a song with 12 writers on it, you know, yeah. you know, out there where here, typically your average country Americana rock song that you're gonna hear out of Nashville is gonna have between one and four writers. Four is big. You get you get four creative minds in one room, all sitting there picking on their guitars. You end up with an awful lot of a lawful awful lot of music. Yeah. And so um, 
So yeah, you looked at the Hot 100 recently, and the average number of writers on the Hot 100 was almost five, and that's average, not yeah. So it's it's crazy. You you gave me a really cool uh, uh, analogy one time about understanding, you know, uh, publishing and the song, and it was something. To, and I'm going to butcher this, but it was something along the lines of you think of the song, the composition, as like the blueprint to the house. But then you can build 20 different houses, you know, from that blueprint. And those are, to your example earlier, might be my cover version of Hey Jude, right? I still have to, you know, pay for that uh, blueprint, but that's, you know, I can have the master, just not the underlying recording, right? That, that's correct. And that's where the division happens. You've got master ownership, which is the record label or the artist. Um, who, who owns that sound recording. Um, and then you've got the actual underlying copyright. Yeah. But you're right. You can build a thousand houses on the blueprint. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. and, and you know, there's, uh, there are fantastic stories of, of old, fantastic catalog that's been pitched and recut. And it's, and it's happened not only in Nashville, but all over, all over yeah. the world. Um, but the, the cutting of songs and, and, and hoping for those mechanical royalties is, is but one line where where revenues come in on publishing the other areas publishing tends to pay very strict close attention to um are performance royalties so performance royalties that is where that bmi relationship comes into play bmi right. ASCAP, csac or right. if you were massively huge global music royalties gmr yeah. um global music rights my apologies um, here in the U.S., but there are collection societies in ev almost every country on earth um, that collect sound recording. And for those that don't know, Randall, what are they collecting royalties on? You said performance rights organizations, PROs, they're collecting revenue. What are they collecting revenue for? So think of it like this. Every time a song is played, somebody gets paid, Okay. So if you're in the grocery store and you hear a song on the overhead, there's a license that covers that, that your PRO has secured with that chain. If you're in a stadium and you hear, you know, a great anthem as the football team runs out onto the field, that's paid for. Um, that's paid for by something called blanket license. Um, you know, it's not only physical places that you're that you're you're present in. It's also terrestrial radio. Every song that's on radio is is getting played, and it's and there there are deals struck that mean more airplay means more money, and so and this is a, this is across the board, and it's a really beautiful thing, both on the digital front and in the terrestrial. Front. And so, um, you know, performance royalty is a massive piece of pie. If you have something that's getting performed, it's it's yeah. the chicken and egg, right? <laughs> you, right, yeah, right? It has to actually be performing for you to for you to be yeah. money on it. But that's yeah, you don't think about that because every time you go into your favorite bar and they're playing music, they've secured a license for that. And, you hear music often, everywhere in the airport, you know. Often with those bars, there'll be a sticker by the door. You can see it from time to time. There'll be a sticker by the door. And the bars that aren't paying their royalties get hounded and get chased down. I had a, I had a buddy who owned a bar that was a lakefront restaurant here, who called me a few years ago and he said, he's he's as country as country gets. Hey man, hey man, what's this ASCAP thing? What's ASCAP? I had Is it legit? Is this real? Yeah, yeah. I mean, he thought he was getting shaken down. Yeah. And, and, and I said, look, man, I said, you gotta, you're making money off the bar. Your burgers are $14 a piece. Why don't you pay some money to the songwriters? Yeah. But the, uh, but you know, any, any venue that has live music as is kind of part of its offering is a target for that. And, and it yeah. should, frankly. Yeah, it, absolutely. Songwriters are the, are the lowest compensated people in the music chain. And so, um, you know, I, I think, you know, by and large, yeah. And so I, I think that for, for them to be compensated and for those those great licensing teams at BMI, ASCAP, CSAC to go yeah. after that business is fantastic. And I, and I think yeah. it's necessary. Well, talk about radio really quickly, because you mentioned it a second ago and, and neighboring rights and, and the way that 
maybe radio pays in the U.S. versus other territories. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, you're trying. You're you're throwing me zingers now. <laughs> um, so radio, there, there's. I'm going to go off publishing for one second and talk about sound recordings because we'll okay. come back to that because you did want to talk about sound. Recordings. Please. Sound recordings in the United States are not afforded a performance right. It's the only right on radio rights that they're not, no, nowhere, not, no, not, no, anywhere. not anywhere. No, no, the performance, right. I'm not talking okay. about sync, right. I'm not talking about, gotcha. I'm talking about, you know, you, you play a recording, you play a sound recording anywhere in the U S you don't have to pay the light, um, which is, which is an old holdback. It's a, it, it basically is a holdout from the early days of radio where the radio lobby was so big. And if you think about even the origins of our record labels, RCA stands for Radio Corporation of America. You know, Broadcast Music Inc. was actually created by the National Association of Broadcasters because they thought ASCAP's royalty rates were too high on radio and they wanted to have an alternative competitor in the field that had lower rates back then. Now, the rate courts and everything have adjusted everything. It's all about the board now. Don't I'm not disparaging BMI at all. But if you look at the history of where it comes from yeah. and how that applies to the music industry, what you realize really quickly is that the radio lobby looked around and said, oh, that's a big bill we've got to pay. What can we do to change that? And so one of the things they did is they made sure that in, in, in the copyright code that sound recordings were not afforded performance rights. So here we are, it's 2021. That's still the case with regards to terrestrial radio. So there are ways that sound recording gets paid, but <clears throat> by and large, you mentioned neighboring rights. That is a European concept. And, and so in, in much of the EU, the UK, et cetera, sound recordings get remunerated just fine through neighboring rights. And, and in the US, the big hotbed topic of the last decade with regards to like that one last place you haven't started collecting your money on your records yet yeah has been neighboring rights i'll tell you this it's a catch-22 if you're not getting airplay don't go after neighboring rights it's a waste it's a yeah. fool's error yeah but if you're getting airplay if your music's getting synced it's on television in the eu there's money in them their hills so um so that's on the sound recording side now on the publishing side Publishing is paid. Publishing yep. gets, a, gets a performance royalty. We, we get that. That's afforded to us both in a digital and in a physical space. Um, neighboring rights also applies to that in the EU. And so it's, it, it is a big catch-all term for, for, the, for that other money I'm due um, yeah. that, that really, really more often than not is applied um, in, in Europe. And so this is where having a great publishing administrator comes into play though, because they can help navigate this space. And, and you know, every publishing company is an administrator of its own publishing or has an administrator. And I think it's really important to talk about publishing administration after we get through the other places that it can be collected, money can yeah. be collected. Yeah. Um, but from a performance standpoint, you're covered on that front. Now <clears throat> with the, uh, with the MLC and the creation of the Music Licensing Collective here um, recently, yeah. we, we now have a direct clearance portal for digital mechanicals, which is kind of a weird hybrid. You know, it's not quite a mechanical, it's not a physical product thing. Mm -hmm. um, but what they did is, is they essentially have negotiated rates with all of the DSPs. So Spotify, uh, Amazon, you name it. Anybody, anybody who's a DSP that's playing, playing your music is gonna have to pay for your music. And so they're reporting and paying to the MLC, which is a clearinghouse. Songwriters, if you have not registered your songs at the MLC, go do it. Gotta do that. Go do it, it's easy, it's easy. If you have a publishing administrator, they've done it for you. Um, you know, you can, you can do, you know, you can do this business you know, bootstrapping it all the way on your own, or, or you can bring in experts that know what they're doing and have them help you. There's no right or wrong way to do it, but, but make sure you register for the MLC because it's an yeah. incredible organization with some, inc 
they have hired some of the smartest people I know in the music business. And it's, it's really been fun to That's watch good to know. get yeah. under because you know, the efforts that are coming from them are, are just really top notch. That, that is really good to know. And you, you just touched on something that I think is really important. Um, and, and let me back up a little bit. I saw this really cool documentary called It All Begins With a Song. And it's all about the Nashville songwriters that do that for a living. You know, they get up in the morning, they go to work, they turn on the coffee and they write songs all day. And then they go home and rinse and repeat, right? And there's, it's just a wonderful documentary if, if uh, listeners haven't seen it. But one of the things they touch on, and I would love to get your expertise on this, is they talk about admin deals and they talk about co-pubs and they talk about, like you just mentioned, you can do this yourself. Um, would you want to? Is it right for everyone? Like, can you, can you just kind of break down what some of those things mean? Huh. I'll do my best. Um, okay. <laughs> so your, your traditional publishing deal you're, you're signing away your songs to a music publisher um, in exchange for money, finances. And, and what they typically do is require a certain number of songs to be turned in within the year. So it's almost like a record deal, but it's yeah, for much. writing the songs. And will they give advances typically? Do they own that uh, in perpetuity? How does that work? They give advances. Um, typically, they, they, in the amount, of, they call it a draw. Okay. It's almost like a salary, except you have to pay it back with royalties. It's a very... It's, it's, it's recoupable. A, yeah, it's all recoupable. Um, but the one thing they typically don't take is your, is, is your writer's share of your performance royalties. And that is something, um, at just free advice to anybody, anybody listening here, do not ever get rid of your writer's share. That's what puts your kids through college. That that's what literally. I mean, that's what will will handle everything there. Um, but publishing is is split. We kind of view publishing as two hundred percent, right? You've got the publisher share and the writer share with regards to royalties. And so, um, so even in a traditional publishing deal, there's a great deal of royalties to, royalties to be made on that writer share um, from the PROs, etc. Now, if you get into a co-publishing deal, this, this is typically something that comes about when you've been writing for a while, you've had some success, you have more leverage in the negotiation. Gotcha. The co-publishing deal effectively says that the publishing share will be split 50-50. So, so you know, you know, normally it's, it's viewed almost like a joint venture. Makes um, sense. From, from a publisher standpoint, they're putting money in you know, normally these are your higher paid writers or these are the JVs where the publishing company is helping the writers pay new writers that they're developing. Um, lots of producers get into this situation. But in that case, you relinquish 50% of your copyright, not 100% of your copyright. And, um, and you typically have a bit more of a financial upside because you had more negotiation room coming into the situation. Now, administration deals. Administration deals are fantastic if you yeah. want to own everything. The, an administration deal is just like a distribution deal. You give up a percentage for service, but it's not a percentage of ownership. It's just a percentage of revenue. Gotcha. So at the end of the day, you still are hold the keys to the kingdom. You're still driving the ship. It's just you're bringing on able-bodied people to help you do it. And, and in exchange for that, you're giving up a percentage of, uh, of the revenues that are coming in. Um, for anyone who is completely self-sufficient and, and doesn't need the connections or the draw or the team that comes with a music publishing deal, an admin deal is a beautiful, beautiful thing to consider. Um, you know, it's typically a longer road to, to riches, it's you know you're not you're not going to be afforded the opportunities that are afforded to someone who's in a publishing deal. Part of part of the reason why people sign up for publishing deals is because they need to be introduced to other people to write with. Yeah, and that goes back to that creative staff. Part of what the creative staff does is put writers in a position to win. So you put them in a room with an artist. You put them in a room with the next hot thing. 
you know, I've seen several cases where, you know, we, we put riders in a room with someone we just really believed in. Next thing you know, they've got a, they've got a, you know, hit record on their hands and they've got a number one and your, and your rider who took a chance getting in the room with a stranger ends up with a great friend for life. You, <laughs> you get a number one. If you co-write a song with somebody and you go number one at, at radio, yeah. you're going to be friends. There's, I, I'm pretty sure that's an, an impossibility that you won't like. Right. Right. Um, right. But, but by, by having a creative staff that made that opportunity happen, that songwriter got their first number one as well. well let me, and so that, yeah, it, I, it is a trade-off. It's a massive trade-off of, of, of access and, and support and, and, and all of the things that you don't know yeah. going into this for, for giving up some ownership. Um, that is super, or, super helpful. Yeah. Um, to kind of wrap my head around that and for our listeners to wrap their heads around that. You've got a lot of great experience with Sync. Symphonic has Bodega. Um, you're, you're very involved in that. Does or do publishers get involved in Sync discussions? Do they push uh, music supervisors, film, TV, games? Are they actively trying to push those songs in for sync licenses any any publisher worth their salt is um there's any publisher that's not chasing sync is asleep at the wheel um because while sync is not you know the thing is a lot of what we've talked about from the mechanicals to the performance royalties these are incremental things that kind of build with time right to get a little bit of success it keeps building keeps building and, and publishers can sit back and kind of just watch the checks come in and make sure that mailbox money go in the right areas. Sync requires a lot of work and it's windfall work. So it's tons and tons and tons of effort and failure <laughs> um, leading up to the one that works that pays so much that it made all the effort and failure worthwhile. Right, right. And, and so, those sinks are negotiated rates unlike some of these publishing things that you're talking about where you know there's a blanket license or a statutory rate with sync how does that work out is it a percentage so let's say you may get ten thousand dollars for a sync you may get a hundred thousand dollars for a sync how does that work on the monetary side so there are norms and yeah. like every other business there's norms yeah. Um, you know, I just took I just took bids on, on on somebody to coat my garage floor, and and it and it was in a range. It was in a range. I knew where the bottom of the range was. And I knew where the top of the range was. Six the same way. It, there are norms, and you know there are situations where you wield more negotiation power going into it. But typically, if we're talking about film or TV, or or really actually. If we're talking about any sync, you know, advertising and movie trailers are, are kind of the two wild cards. Um, but film, TV, video games typically have a fixed budget and they have an amount they can pay up to um, that they're willing to pay and they know the norms. And so, you know, part of it is if you have a publisher that's got a great sync team and there are so many great sync teams in the publishing space. Really? That team knows. They, they know. They the know the range. They know they, the value. Yeah, it's not a thing where if a music supervisor sends you a brief that says, "Hey, I've got ten thousand. I need a, I need a, you know, radio hit from the nineteen eighties, um, and I've got ten thousand all in. That means five thousand to the publisher, five thousand to, to the label. They know what they're pitching. They know whether it'll clear or whether it won't clear. There's not, it, it's not a good look to go back and send them something and have them go, oh, I really love that, and go, all right, let's have instead of ten, let's let's do let's do seventeen. You know, typically there these are very fixed budgets. Gotcha. Um, the, the the one place where negotiation can come in is when the supervisor just calls you and says, you know, hey, I'd like to use this song. I've got five, and you know, at that point you can go, all right, but is that it? Is there you know there is room to negotiate there, and there and the negotiations have to be really nuanced because you've got to. It's a fine line between getting a little bit more money and ticking off your consumer, who is the public, who are, sorry, who is the, the, the music supervisor. Yeah. Sense. And so um, that negotiation happens, but you're right. It's the wild west. And, you know, there's, I've seen things, you know, I think the largest singular deal I ever did was a half million dollar. Payday. Wow. For one sink. 
one one sink. And um, and, and I, you know, but I've seen things run run the gamut, you know. And I've seen I, I've seen that very song synced into an independent project that didn't have as much money yeah. for a fraction of that. Yeah. Um, it's it's all about how much money do they have and how much money they're willing to spend and how much money you're willing to take. But those opportunities are afforded to you by having a publishing team and having a sync team within that publishing team that can go out and find that opportunity. If you're doing the independent thing, I'm just moving the pendulum back over to the independent side of things. Yeah. You say, nope, don't need that. I've got my PRO situation and I've got everything sorted. You, you probably are going to want to hire, you know, a, a hired gun to go after that. Yeah. And there's different ways these these rep deals are set up, but would highly recommend that you get it an equity based rep deal where they eat what they kill. Um, I, there's very few services in this music business where I think artists should have to pay people. And, and, you know, marketing is one where there's real effort involved and there's absolutely there's no guaranteed payback. And I think that marketing companies and, and, and PR folks are, are in a, are in a stance where they have to be paid because there's yeah. not a way for them to share really, right. in the success. But in the case of a sync, when, when a rep says, I want to rep your music for sync, um, you know, the discussion should be, okay, cool. You can rep it and I'll give you, you know, 35, 40% of whatever you bring. 35 sure. or 40% of nothing is still nothing. And yeah. if they bring revenues, then, then they've earned their key. Do they typically ask for exclusivity? You know, this is a big question. So there's a, there's a dividing line on it. Um, I like exclusivity and we like exclusivity with Bodega because it eliminates that headbutt moment when, when a music supervisor, you know, says they want to license the song and you've got two people who pitch the same song and music supervisor. Right. And you end up, you end up aggravating and angering the supervisor in that situation. And it ends up doing you more political damage than it does good Makes to sense. have multiple people out there. You know, I think limited term relationships with companies that are exclusive where you say, okay, I'll give you, I'll give you two years. I'll give you three years. Let's see how it goes. At the end of that, you evaluate it. It's either working or it's not. If it's not working, then you can walk. And if it is, then you stick around. I think that's a really healthy way to go about it. Yeah. The idea of just kind of, you know, you know, carpet bombing from yeah. multiple areas is in theory, it makes sense, but you know, you have to realize that in, I'm just going to focus on Los Angeles right now because it's the epicenter for this. You know, when you look at the music supervisor world, it's a really big high school. It's not, it, you're not talking about tens of thousands of contacts. The chances that, this rep has contacts this rep doesn't have are minimal. Yeah. The team at Netflix is the team at Netflix is the team at Netflix. Right. And they all have the same yeah. Rolodex. That's it. That's it. And they may have, you know, they may have better relationships with certain people. Absolutely. But they're not going to, it's not like they're going to afford you access to people that the other company doesn't afford you access to. Yeah. And so that's why, you, you know, you, those that are trusted players in the game, do good work, and 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 you see it because uh, because you see their music all over, and you see their, yeah. them in the credits, yeah. and you hear people talk about them. Word of mouth goes. I'm sure it's a little bit like what you do with Label Logic. I I, I imagine you don't do a lot of advertising. No, it's like a, a wedding photographer or a real estate agent. It's word of mouth. You do somebody you know proud. You do a good job. They tell their friends, right? And in the sync rep games, the same way. But but I but if you don't have a publisher actively advocating for you and you don't have a record label, most labels have a sync team also. Right. Actively advocating for you for those opportunities, then you know you've got two choices. You do it yourself, which is like climbing Mount Kilimanjaro on your knees, <laughs> or you can find somebody to help you. you yeah. Know. Yeah. So let me ask you one last thing on here. I mean, I could talk to you all day and sometimes we do. But um, to, for those that don't know, you touched on the MLC and how important that is, make sure you're registered. What about sound exchange? What can you tell people that don't know about sound exchange? Okay, that's great. So sound exchange, um, 
first, we're going to circle back to that lack of public performance royalty for sound recordings. Okay. Um, the, the important things you need to know about sound exchange are that it is for master recordings. It's not for publishing. And so sound exchange is one of those kind of nebulous clearing houses that, that only does one thing, but because it's kind of like the PROs in, in a sense, it tends to be part of that conversation. So it's like, you know, well, let's talk about per performance royalties, you know, be my ASCAP CSAC sound exchange. It's like, well, that's like, you know, apples and pineapples right there. You, you can't, you know, they're not the same thing, yeah. but they kind of do a lot of the same thing. So what sound exchange does is it collects digital performance royalties um, from non-interactive streams. Well, let's talk about that for a second. What's a non-interactive stream for those that don't know? Are we talking Pandora? Are we talking Sirius XM? Sirius XM, Pandora, any web radio. It doesn't have to be the biggies. Okay. But any web radio has to technically be registered and be paying royalties that direction. Um, Pandora and Sirius XM are, are, are the big ones. And, and, you know, for a lot of artists, if you get into regular rotation on Sirius, it can be a massive payday. It can really? be amazing, amazing things. Um, Sound Exchange collects those royalties and they pay them out. In order for them to pay them out, you have to be registered at Sound Exchange or you have to have an intermediary working with you at Sound Exchange. In our case, Symphonic actually does Sound Exchange collections on behalf of our labels. Um, we have that set up as part of our service. We have a feed that we deliver to Sound Exchange of, of all of the recordings that we have in distribution. Oh, okay. Possibly earning. It's an automatic thing. If you, um, if you, are doing it yourself, you have to manually input that data and you have to make sure that the, the data is correct. It sound exchange sounds like a beast. So, so sound exchange collects both on the label side and on the artist side, which is pretty cool because yeah. it allows artists to actually register themselves also. And so the, it's an additional way to make some cash. Um, it, it's a, you know, it's a phenomenal organization. You know, one of the nice things about them is that they will, if you're not registered, sit on the money and wait on you to come get it for a period of time. And so um, a lot of people call to it box money or mm -hmm. there's, there's a million different words people use for it. Um, you know, in, in, in my experience, you know, I, my, my early days in the industry, I worked for the world's leading classical record label, a label called Naxos. Yeah. It's also the biggest distributor of classical music in the world. And Sound Exchange had just launched. And I remember my CEO, who was a brilliant fellow and a mentor of mine named Jim Selby, um, pouring through Excel sheets. I mean, I'm talking staying up until 2 a.m. every night for weeks on end going through Excel sheets. Um, because we what we figured out was there was a tranche of cash there that we were due. And his efforts there and the team's efforts there, I think, yielded more than a million dollars in found revenue. Wow. Um, and this was at the launch. So obviously, you know, this is not something, if you don't have a catalog, a massive catalog that's earning, you know, and getting those plays, you're not going to have the revenue there. Um, yeah. But that said, even people that have a little bit of airplay here and there, or if your distributor puts your music into Pandora and you know your consumption's pretty good on Pandora, there's sound exchange money waiting on them. Awesome. That's great. Randall, thank you so much for taking the time out of your, your busy day. Uh, I'm not going to get out to see you during Americana Fest, but I am going to be coming to Nashville soon, and uh, we will break bread and solve all the industry's problems uh, over a beer. I look forward to it. All right, brother. Thanks again so much. Thank you so much, Jay. I appreciate you, and I, I love doing these kind of things. So thanks for the invite. Thank you, brother. Discmakers.com. Use code FREEBIZ for ground shipping on CD orders of 100 units.